All right, well, we're going to get started with this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Steve Becker. I am with uh, CCS, part of the Protein Processing Services Group, who's um, putting together these series of webinars. And uh, we are a uh, uh, provider of uh, everything from feasibility studies to um, planning, uh, design, and construction. So I happen to be on the construction side of the group and uh, hosting this uh, webinar today. Uh, so I want to get right into it and introduce uh, a couple of our, our guests. Uh, they're with Ultrasource out of Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, we've got uh, Noah Hall and Derek Schroeder joining us. I think we will turn it over to Noah and, and get started on a review of their company. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, thanks for having us and hosting the webinar as well. Um, like uh, Steve said, Derek and I are based out of Kansas City with the company Ultrasource. Uh, and we are located here in Kansas City as a supplier for uh, meat and food processing equipment primarily, uh, some other industries as well. but. Uh, just kind of going to run through the company and uh, kind of the partnership that we're doing with protein processing and uh, in terms of what expertise we bring to the table and helping uh, provide some of their customers with uh, a complete solution to start the day. Um, so just a little bit of background. Uh, we were founded uh, in 1883 under the name Koch Brothers Supply. Uh, Scotch Equipment and Supplies was kind of a, a cornerstone name for the company up until about 2012. And in 2012, um, there was actually a split in the company back in 2000, where some of the company, the supply side was sold to another part and the equipment side was retained. And the supply portion of it couldn't be brought back into the fold until uh, the name was changed from Koch, uh, from the UK. So we changed the name to Ultrasource in 2012. And one of the, uh, again, the industries we kind of target is equipment and supplies to the meat and food industry. Uh, we're both a, a direct manufacturer or OEM and an importer as well. So uh, again, company-wide, we're about 120 employees uh, and most of them are located right here in Kansas City. Um, so when looking at uh, why companies do business with us uh, from a standpoint. We look at uh, that we are an American family owned. Uh, the owner lives right here in Kansas City and uh, is in and out of the office on a regular basis. Um, but our offering really surrounds customers from start to finish. Uh, and I think when, when we go through our product offering and kind of the team uh, that we put together as well, we try and give up uh, a lot of value to our customers in what they can do. We always look for innovation or ways to help uh, our customers' businesses grow. And uh, we do sink a lot of uh, investment here in our resources, both here in Kansas City uh, and the people itself to make sure we're trained and up to date on some of the latest uh, techniques and knowledge that's out there in the industry. And we are we consider ourselves a very stable partner to grow with. Uh, like I said, the, the company extends back all the way into the 1800s, but even some of our uh, non-manufactured equipment uh, we have a long-term relationship with a lot of our vendors. Uh, there's several of them that we've been doing business with for over 20 years. Uh, and we consider ourselves to offer a, a really reliable solution uh, while still pushing for that innovation. So from a company structure standpoint, we kind of have different segments of the business. Um, we go kill floor, processing, packaging and into labeling. And I'll say that's kind of the heart of a lot of these uh, meat and food processing plants is seeing a flow similar to that. And it doesn't necessarily matter what type of, of protein you're doing or what type of uh, food ingredient, you have a, a process similar to that. Uh, and then the operational supplies, like I said, really kind of envelops it from start to finish. Uh, no matter where you're at in the business, you can really look around and, and point out items that we're able to supply to uh, help these businesses run on a day-to-day. -day. So from, uh, from a customer 
standpoint, like we've invested in having some demonstration uh, facilities here with lots of testing capabilities. We have a dedicated uh, processing space, uh, kind of show most of it here in this image where we can demonstrate a lot of uh, food equipment processes. We have classroom facilities. Uh, we typically look to do a an ultra source academy uh, and we'll bring up this video here that kind of shows some of the uh, test kitchen in action. But this is really uh, a facility that we try and make sure that customers can come see, get hands on uh, work. And then with this, the Ultra Source Academy, it's a meat processing seminar that's about two and a half days long. And we bring in customers and give them uh, the experience of not only you know, the processes and the equipment and everything that's involved there, but we really get into trying to make sure that they have opportunities to share knowledge as well. Uh, you know, whether it's how they're going about doing their, their pricing or their structure or the flow with the business. And when we get into uh, kind of at the end of the course, we like to do uh, a product show to really show everything start to finish. And we typically make about 25 products in those two and a half days and really just kind of hit on some of the core science even uh, because some of these people grew up in the business and they understand that they make this product and they make it that way because their dad or their grandpa taught them how to do it that way. And they really haven't dug in and, and tried to understand some of the science. So we try and bring some of that to our customers uh, as an option as well. And we do have a dedicated food scientist or application specialist on hand uh, that their really core job function is to support those customers outside of fixing a piece of equipment, selling a piece of equipment and parts like that. A lot of companies offer that, but we really want to have that expertise to bring in the uh, that added value for our customers. And then not only that, we have uh, we also have some other people on staff that have uh, degrees in meat science. I have a master's degree in meat science. Uh, Derek Schroeder, who's on this, also has a master's degree in meat science. We have uh, another one that got an emphasis uh, undergraduate in meat science. And then we have a couple more that are actually due to come on staff here uh, in the first uh, half of 2021. So really just building our expertise and trying to add value to our customers outside of just offering them equipment solutions. And this also is uh, a view of our smokehouse room. Uh, you know, we like to use that to be able to run those products all the way through to the end. Uh, and just in case we get really hungry, we might go smoke a slab of bacon for lunch. Uh, moving into the kill floor, uh, the business, we're starting out with the kill floor side of it. And there's lots of different pieces and expertise that we supply uh, into this function. So if you look at like an overall view of uh, a standard kill floor, you've got the animal entry area. And then from whether you're going through restraint, bleeding, into the skinning, evisceration, splitting, trim and inspection, scale, hot box, and you got the rail system. So all this for the most part is gonna be pretty standard whether you're trying to do 10 to 15 head a day or you're trying to push over hundred head a day. You have some sort of flow to the facility and that's something that we like to bring to the table is just making sure that we can not only offer the equipment but make sure uh, if you're designing a system, uh, making sure that it flows through the facility well and really make sure that you don't build it with any bottlenecks or uh, and, and understand where your constraints are gonna be in your process. Um, you know, and like I said, you can do small scale facilities up to where it's more of a, uh, a continuous flow where you've got multiple animal, animals flowing through the facility uh, at different points in the game, uh, thinning and evisceration, and on down to uh, the hot box cooler, that initial kill, uh, kill down cooler after the kill. Um, we do a little bit with uh, coolers as well. Mainly the component we bring in is just making sure the rail design uh, switches, everything like that is going to be spaced out correctly, uh, that you're not going to have any bottlenecks there. And that's kind of where we touch in on that process. When we get into the uh, processing flow, uh, this is where we get into the carcass breakdown. Uh, we get into I'm going to show some videos here of just uh, different pieces of equipment uh, running on processes. And so in this case, we're running a, a test with a frozen rack of lamb. 
So this is frozen solid, just came straight out of the freezer. And what we were doing there is just giving it uh, kind of an application test. We had a customer that wanted to see a video of running some frozen product. Um, so that's what we were doing in that video. Um, when we get into the mix and grinding, a lot of these facilities, especially the ones that are beef or pork, you start out with that breakdown and you're doing the retail cuts uh, or wholesale cuts, but then at some point you're going to do some grinding in the process as well. So, so in this case, uh, you know, I'll say this is kind of, a, I'll say a mid-size uh, grinder that we offer. We do offer uh, ones that would be in, you know, that 10 to 15 head plant day, but this would get into even a separate facility that's only doing grinding and the processing. So this one they're doing, I think it's going to end up being about uh, 250 pounds in a minute. And then once you get that ground product done, that's another solution that we step into. And we've got a couple of uh, three different applications that we'll show here where in this case, we're offering equipment that is doing uh, a one pound brick for ground beef. You'll see that in the retail, uh, super common right now where they're taking that uh, brick, dropping it directly in a packaging machine. Uh, and from there it's gonna go out into retail. So, the uh, first piece of equipment in this video is the vacuum stuffer, which is responsible for the portioning. And then we're just doing some cutting afterwards and it's all made by the same manufacturer. So uh, everything's shaking. And then uh, another ground application that we get into is gonna be in forming patties. And there's a lot of different ways to form patties. Uh, you can have a standalone machine that's doing a specific mold. In this case, we're using that same uh, vacuum stuffer and the cutting device and then we're gonna go ahead and integrate to where we're putting in a piece of paper underneath uh, or interleaving, and then we're dropping it into a tray uh, and stacking it. So this one, in this case, is gonna be a two by two tray, and then it would go on to the packaging line. Uh, in this case, that would be targeting at a tray sealer. So really just looking to get a good flow for the uh, production. And, a system like this really helps remove labor. Um, and I'll say that you can start out by removing each of the end pieces and work your way backwards, depending on where you're at in terms of uh, automation or the amount of, uh, amount of manual labor that you have available for your output. And then another really common one when you get into the ground products uh, is doing a flipper. So in this case, you've got one that is uh, going to be doing approximately 35 uh, one pound chubs a minute. Really just kind of putting a clip on both ends, uh, put some metal clip on. So pretty, pretty much the same thing as what you'd see for uh, like ground sausage in the retail. Uh, in the, uh, so that's kind of the, I'll say the core process is that when you're looking at a uh, a facility that, hey, we want to do a lot of beef processing. At, at some point, you may not have these exact machines or these exact sizes, but you're going to have them going on somewhere in your process. Uh, and what you're trying to do is create some value or create additional markets to uh, send product out. And then when you get into doing some of the cooking processes as well, that's another spot to add value, whether you're going to be making you know, snack sticks, jerky, summer sausage, a lot of those products, um, it's one of those investments that you make that it, it's a pretty good initial upfront investment, but you just keep that thing running and every time it runs, uh, it's adding value into that. So we can get them as low as where one cart uh, would go into there, uh, all the way up to, we've got installations where you're putting 12 carts in at a time. So you can have a pretty significant volume uh, running through a smoke. That's, it really is another step to add value. And then once you get that product uh, kind of formed or portioned into the way you want it, uh, you've got different avenues that you're going to be using for this. Um, one of it is the chamber machine, uh, where you're looking to mainly do, I'll say, primal cuts, or if you're doing small scale packaging, 
um, you know, we'll say this is the step above the cut and wrap uh, with butcher paper. So when you get into this, um, anything from primals down to small scale volume of retail. And then over here is a tray sealer where you're taking like those hamburger patties that were in a tray already formed. Uh, we'll drop them into the, the tray sealing machine. There, those will get uh, packaged. And then here's an example of another machine, which I'd say is kind of the trend in the industry right now is to go to horizontal form fill seal or roll stock. So this is at a customer of ours here in Kansas City, where they are taking retail cuts, uh, steaks in this case, and the uh, worker is placing them in the pouch. And then in this case, this is a two by two configuration. So it's gonna run those four pockets at a time and seal them. And then they have an employee standing at the end of the machine that's catching and boxing them. Um, so in, in this process, going through a roll stock, uh, it's a big labor savings in terms of what they can do for output. I'll say if these two people were doing the same process on a chamber machine, probably take them five hours for what they can do in one hour. And it gives it a, a really nice clean look. Uh, it's really common in today's retail packaging. And you'll see like we've got customers that they only do 10 to 15 head a week and they're running a roll stock machine just because of the labor savings and they have to go out and try and maintain labor just that much less. Um, and then we get into another part, which we call labeling, where we've got kind of two versions uh, that are out there. One is placing a pre-printed label on a machine. We might be printing on a code date to, for the date of production or a, a small uh, ingredient statement on it. Uh, but most of the time those are pre-printed and ready to place. And then we also get into what's called weight price labeling. So anytime we want to put a weight on the package, or anytime we want to do a weight and a price, we need to have a scale system set up. And in this case, that's how this machine is set up, where the software in it also provides a lot of flexibility for different customers. Like we'll find this is a, a roll stock machine in this video. Uh, it's going to come discharge off the machine and then it'll get uh, sorted into a single lane and then it'll do a weight and price. And that second belt in the section in the machine is for weight and price. Uh, and then it applies the label before it exits the machine. One of the, uh, one of the benefits of that weight price and the software uh, that goes with these is that you can manage uh, multiple customers. So if some customers wanna have have ground beef pro program set up for three or four different ranches and you kind of select the customer and you select the product ID and you can switch back and forth between them really easily. So once that initial setup happens, uh, you can be running uh, the customer's label and design. Those printers are a little bit more, uh, more complete in terms of what they can put on that label. Ingredient statements, uh, those are all part of it as well. And then again, getting into the supplies business that kind of wraps everything from start to finish. Um, you know, we've got the, the totes that you'd be moving meat around with, the film that the machines use, uh, the boots, the knives, hats, gloves, just anything on a daily basis that you're using to support that uh, operation uh, really runs through our supplies division. And we've got a, a high emphasis on just trying to make sure that the items that we're offering are our customers. And that, for the most part, wraps up um, what I had uh, ready to present. And we've got all sorts of information. So like a lot of the videos that I showed, we've got uh, on our YouTube channel. So feel free to uh, go in and check them out. If you have any questions on them, feel free to reach out to Derek or I. Um, and then for the most part, that's uh, what I had to present. Great questions. Uh, turn back over to you guys, Steve. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Matt. Thanks a lot, Noah. Um, if there's some questions, uh, you can type them in the in the chat box. But uh, I guess I have one. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about industry trends. Can you 
talk a little bit about what you're saying. You guys deal with a um, lot of a lot of producers. Um, are you seeing anything in you know this recent year, <laughs> in this uh, COVID year that uh, is different than previous years? Yeah, Derek, you wanna start? That? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll jump in. Can everyone hear me? Yep. All right. So I, from our perspective, what we see a lot of is is cattle feeders, ranchers, producers wanting to you know, kind of build their own facility and, and integrate and take control of the finished product. Uh, likewise, uh, we also see plants, existing plants that maybe have changed hands and are looking to upgrade. That's kind of the big trend is. is yeah, I think the, the vertical integration, vertical yep. integration for a lot of these people trying to market their products. Uh, I think has really seen a lot of legwork and especially when COVID first hit and some of the larger plants were shutting down, kind of that small to medium was looking to remove any bottlenecks, but then you also see uh, that, that business uh, kind of sprout up where people are like, I want to have more control over the product I'm producing. And so kind of the big thing there is uh, a lot of guys doing cooler expansions or, or expanding really most of those guys, it's just getting more cooler space, more hanging space, because that's kind of what limits most of the small guys from doing 15 to 20 a week to going to 30 plus a week is just the cooler space. All right, thanks guys. Um, uh, just quick question. Mo almost all that packaging is, is done under a vacuum, it creates a vacuum, right? Yeah, I would say that's the most common. Uh, you do, you do get some like on a tray sealer, uh, more typically you'll see it on a seal only or a modified atmosphere, depending on the product. Most of the time meat industry, uh, you'd be doing full vacuum or in some applications, a modified atmosphere, uh, where you're actually pulling a full vacuum but then releasing a different mix of gases back into the package than what would uh, normally be in standard air. I would say another trend, back to the trend topic, another trend we see is, though it touched on it with packaging, but it goes the same with uh, ground beef processing. You know, a lot of guys are going from either filling the little poly chub bags off of their grinder or piston stuffer into a vacuum stuffer, which gives you portion control. So you hit the meat lever and it sends one pound every time. And they might start filling bags that way and then go, okay, let's go the next step farther, faster, and go, all right, I want to do the chubs like I see at the grocery store. So they're just advancing uh, their technology increasing. small communities, labor is hard to come by. And then with COVID, uh, I've lost even more of the labor pool. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Derek. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the machines that we saw were, were pretty good sized. I know we, we were talking the other day, <clears throat> you, you do have some smaller versions that, that may uh, uh, help out, uh, you know, labor for, for the smaller shops out there. Um, in, in many of those cases, right? Yeah, I would say, so our, our primary offering ranges from, we'll say if you wanna do 25 to 50 pounds, there's equipment that'll handle that pretty easily. And then all the way up into, if you wanna do uh, over a thousand pounds at a time, uh, we can get into those applications too. So um, if you start getting below 25 pounds, it maybe gets a little bit on the small side, but uh, that 25 and and up is, is pretty easily achieved. Okay, but yeah, it, it all provides a, a more efficient uh, shop, <clears throat> which is the goal. So, okay, we, uh, uh, let's see, we've got a question here. Um, for smaller plants looking to track the carcass from kill to package, do you have a software system that does that, or is that something that would be integrated into the labeling machines? So on the, so 
like on the Aspera, you can do, you can track package counts and you can set it up. I mean, we went through some of that, Steve, when you were here in Kansas City, where uh, you could set it up where different customers you might, might want to do uh, you know, like a hundred packs of one pound and make sure that runs through and labels it. But it's not, I'll say, we don't have anything specifically that says, all right, I have a 873 pound hanging weight. Here's the exact product mix that I got out of that, uh, out of that cart. Um, so no, nothing, nothing specifically that's saying a, uh, an exact now, in the label software, you could track, like if you're running everything through, like the Aspera doing the weight price, you could run that through where everything that was on that, uh, as long as it's gonna get a label and run across that scale, then it'll tell you exactly what that total amount was for, you know, if you have an individual ID for that animal, you could do that, uh, but you gotta place everything on that scale or run it through everything on that. You have some sort of uh, nomenclature in the label software to do. Uh, depending on on how you want to do it, uh, there's some potential there, but I'll say it's not just a you put in the carcass weight and and it'll spit it right out. <clears throat> okay, thanks. No, I I uh, the protein processing group has talked to a couple of uh, uh, software uh, providers that would help in in this case track that uh, through the facility and and also maintain a database of customers. So that there is some technology out there that would definitely help with that. Okay, the next question is, uh, do you offer site-specific consulting for layout when retrofitting an existing building? And um, I might start with that. Uh, from the protein processing uh, group, we, we are doing that, uh, have done that. And um, yeah, we would like to uh, chat with you and see if, if it's a good fit um, with what we bring to the table. We also <clears throat> partner with Noah and Derek uh, when we take a look at those and um, um, kind of consult with each other as we work through that process. But uh, yeah, the answer is yes, we would uh, consult on uh, retrofitting, retrofitting an existing building. Uh, okay. All right. So I don't see any more questions. I will, let me add a little contact information in, in here from the protein processing group. I don't have a slide, but, uh, my name is Steve Becker and, um, um you can contact me at S Becker at sencon, C-E-N-C-O-N.com, or, um, um, that's the, or my cell phone number is 402-690-9226. Um, all right, so we do have another question. Um, Noah, what do you recommend for time in hot box versus time in cooler for a beef carcass? So on, on a beef carcass, I would say most of the time in a hot box, you're probably looking at 18 to 24 hours to fully chill down to uh, the temperature range that you want. And then when you get into the cooler, um, I'll say that there's not really a hard set, uh, a hard set timeline. Um, if you're looking from a, a beef aging and tenderness, there's all sorts of research studies that have been done. Um, Studies have kind of shown, I'll say you get the, the majority of your tenderness uh, from the aging is gonna happen in the 10 to 14 day window. So, uh, but there's also been some research studies that have shown that if you age it for seven days and then freeze it, uh, that it gets about the same tenderness as what it would have been on that 14 days. And then you kind of have an understanding too of what's it gonna do after it leaves the cooler. Uh, because if it's leaving your, process, your facility frozen, then that aging process is stopped altogether. So if you're doing like fresh, uh, either wholesale or retail cuts, that aging will continue to happen as long as that package isn't frozen. So depending on what your uh, you know, quality or desired 
attributes are in that product, that's kind of the time window you're looking at. You see a lot of, a lot of custom places are maybe killing uh, once a week on you know, beef and then they'll uh, age it for you know, maybe 10 to 14 days in the cooler on some of the smaller facilities. I've seen once you start getting up in that 50 to 100 head a day, you really are turning that product a lot more consistently and you're also taking it to uh, the retail chain or sending it out. It's more common to send it out in a, uh, an unfrozen state. So it's gonna age in the, in the process as it goes through the distribution chain. So the, the aging in the cooler is a little bit more dynamic. The hot box is pretty straightforward that just figure on you're gonna need a day. Okay, good, thanks Noah. All right, well, um, that may cover it for today. If, um, if anybody uh, either on the call or, or uh, are watching this as a recording, um, I think you should probably show your uh, contact information, um, Noah, and uh, if you got that handy, Yep, absolutely. So it, our email address is noah, N-O-A-H dot hall, H-A-L-L at ultrasourceusa.com and Derek dot Schroeder at ultrasourceusa.com. So feel free to reach out to you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, so on, on behalf of the uh, protein processing group, we want to thank you for your time and the information. Uh, hopefully it was helpful to, to those that um, dropped in and uh, for the webinar. Um, our contact information here is, um, well, there's proteinprocessing.com. Um, you can find us out on a, on a website or uh, you can email me at sbecker uh, at sencon, C-E-N-C-O-N.com. And uh, we will wrap this up. Thanks again uh, for everyone's time. And have a good rest of the day.